through another zine that I received from last year's zine quest and this is planar compass issue one originally it was called Dreamhaven, but i gather that someone sort of trademarked that so sort of just after it came out or just before it was released or something like that but it was swiftly rebranded as planar compass and new versions sent out although i do still have my hard copy with the original logo on it so that's quite nice you know got a bit of difference between the pdf and the hard copy so on the first page we get a dedication to all the people who've sort of helped with it all the people who backed it and stuff like that we can see that the writing editing and layout was done by dm wilson writing and editing by sarah brunt the art was by chris downey and dm wilson so let's move on and see what we've got first of all we've got a table of contents here always nice to see it's about 60 pages long we move straight on into the introduction and as you can see there's a nice clear layout with all the, the sort of headings separated with these sort of like dotted lines which i quite like makes it very clear where the headings are and the text is fairly sizable and easy to read the print version of it's in the sort of a5 slash digest format apologies if i'm getting them mixed up i'm always getting those two mixed up so we can see that Dreamhaven was written for the last zine quest and was designed for old school essentials. We get a list of the old school essentials books you'll be required to play it and some optional books that may help. We then get some advice on running Dreamhaven and obviously if you're going to have your GM running this or you're going to play in this then I'm going to try and avoid two overt spoilers but chances are i'll slip up somewhere along the way and i'm going to talk about what's in the zine so you know if you're going to play in this maybe don't watch this review until you've actually played it or check with your gm first at least so we're told that the adventures in this issue are designed for levels or one to three and that's with your typical sort of D, D setting but we're told there's a fairly low emphasis on encounter balance which is a good thing to make gms aware of because you know old school games have a sort of slightly different aesthetic with regards to encounter balance than newer games do we're told about the end of the this sort of little mini campaign or these series of adventures potentially having a game ending or at least dream haven ending event that will occur we're told that within the deep warren is a magical hedge maze which is the border area to different planes of existence. And the portal can be an alluring prospect to players, which is nice to see because it allows you to drop the game into your sort of existing campaign setting. And I gather since Dreamhaven, the, the main sort of like island in this astral sea where this zine is set, is supposed to be on the astral plane. That's normally sort of a stopping off point in your typical D&D &D cosmology. There's a couple of suggestions given for how you could like get players into this. One is to use it as a one-shot or a campaign starter. Perhaps the players are stranded on Dreamhaven. Maybe they were shipwrecked. Either way, they've got to get off the island and get back to where they were. The second one is as a campaign break where the players find themselves stuck there due to high taxes that have been levied and they have to raise enough funds to pay these taxes so they can move on. And it's nice to see a little couple of sort of little mini scenarios there, a little starter hints there that you could use to get going with this. As we move on, we get locales and locals. We're told that the setting is situated in the Astral Sea which connects all the vast planes of the multiverse. Ship sails across its dark waters of psychic energy under a black sky of endless stars. Very atmospheric. And in the sort of style of the Old School Essential books, we get, I can point in the right direction, if you can see there, there's sort of bullet points with bold titles that sum them up. So for instance, Psychic Waters, translucent dark black and purple waves that give way to nebulas and stars and the big black 
The sky overhead being black and full of stars, but there are silver clouds. Despite this, there is a perpetual ambient light. And I really like this style of doing things. I have done it ever since sort of picking up old school essentials because it enables you at a glance to see the sort of important little factoids about the area that you're looking at. We're told that in the middle of the sea lies a port island where a lot of interplanar trade passes through. And this is Dreamhaven, a safe haven from storms and refugees from pirates. We get a little bit of background on Dreamhaven itself. We're told that Paleo Y was a fearsome and notorious pirate, but it all changed when he wrecked a cargo ship on an island in the middle of the Astral Sea. It seemed like that was the end of his story until a ship anchored offshore to give the crew some much needed leave. A younger paleo would have slain them, claimed the ship and used it to escape the island. But as he was getting on a bit, he was probably starting to get into the autumn of his years and think about maybe retiring. He decided to try something new. He sold them drinks and thus Dreamhaven was born and expanded from there. And there's a couple of little secrets here, which I'm not going to go into detail with on the audio, but suffice to say, the island is more than it seems. We're given a couple of paragraphs telling us about species of note that tend to populate the island. There's the Onauk, who are horned, sort of, I suppose, tiefling-esque pirates, is the sort of vibe I'm getting off them. The Aldhesi, short fey with innate psionic powers, with pale, almost translucent skin. Belsariso, furry humanoids who resemble raccoons, and instantly I'm thinking Guardians of the Galaxy, to be perfectly honest, Rocky Raccoon, who doesn't love a bit of that. The Skulga, who are skinny goblins with heads that look like deer skulls. That's quite interesting. And we have the Chamicoids, who are clockwork robotic-like beings found throughout the astral plane, working to earn money for a mysterious high master. So again, you could sort of feed a little bit more into that if you wish. And obviously, humans, because let's face it, humans are everywhere in D&D. We're told a little bit about how time is kept in the Astral Sea. Then we move on to island locations and characters. And at the top there, we've got a nice sort of blue-tinted version of the, the picture that is on the front cover, but different areas are labelled. So we have the docks, which are obviously the lifeblood of Dreamhaven as a trading port. There's plenty of sailors there, merchants, travellers coming in and out. And we're given five locals ranging from Saturday's Star, a Bel Ceriso smuggler who has a ship, the Wharf Rat docked, to Captain Hector, a, a person who t- tends to resolve his problems by burning them from the looks of his description. His former ship, the Nick Tater, was lost in an incident, probably involving fire. And he now drunkenly wanders the docks looking for a new ship and crew. And it's a nice little sort of slice of the sort of stuff you might find in the dock district, but you can easily expand it. We get three rumours, one secret, saying, you know, there's a secret entrance leading to the Deep Warren, the area below Dreamhaven, a couple of hooks, and we get a couple of sort of NPC box outs on the right there. And a couple of nice pictures of those NPCs. Area 2 is the Slipstream Bar, which is what it sounds like. It's pretty much your ubiquitous sort of D&D tavern, but given a sort of plainer twist. And this is the original building that Paleo opened on the island. Again, we get some rumours, secrets, locals and hooks here. And we get a nice little bit of art down in the corner. We also get some stats for Paleo Y, who is an orc. So he looks a bit orcish, which I'm guessing is where the name comes from, because it's fairly similar. But obviously they have these almost like tiefling-like horns. We're told that the drink of choice for travellers passing through Dreamhaven is Upper Grog, made from the distilled condensation of psychic storms. The heady drink is used by astral sailors to stave off sleep on their long journeys, and once consumed... It has a number of effects, meaning that you can stay awake, shrug off sleep, but at the end of that period of time, you have to make a save or you will crash hard and sleep for 8 to 6 hours. And also, 
if you've had an additional save, you can become quite addicted to the effects of Grog. So it sounds to me like it cuts, it's a cross between more sort of hardline drugs and like a super version of like an energy drink, which I could see like sailors who are working hard in like the astral planes. They've got so much work to do. They can't afford to like have more than a couple of hours shut eye, banging that down them to keep themselves going. Three is the guest rooms located on an annex to a massive ship that makes up the main building there are rooms for rent there frequented by sailors merchants guests etc and we get a breakdown of one person's room and like a couple of little bullet points that tell us that sailors rooms cost 25 copper pieces a night and merchants rooms cost five gold pieces a night but are obviously more spacious they have more furnishings and niceties and stuff like that Area 4 is the Bazaar, which is a large open place market located in the open area of a ship's hull. Within you can find collections of vendors and goods being sold to the various traders and people passing through Dreamhaven. And again, we get a couple of locals detailed here. Area 5 is a warehouse, which is pretty much what you'd expect. It's a storage area. We, we then get details on the lighthouse, home of the mysterious sea informant. They haven't been seen in years, but I know to distribute an astral almanac by way of a drop box just outside the entrance. And that's a nice thing because that would allow you, if you wanted to use this as part of your campaign, to sort of almost put out like a little newsletter or something, but have it as an in-game artifact. So you distribute your newsletter to the players and then say, your character has actually got this. You've just picked up a copy outside the lighthouse. And we're told that, shh, keep, keep it under your heart, but we're told the sea informants are reclusive camouflage salamander. So they could be about anywhere, to be honest. There is a customs house and Vulcanus Smithy, where Vulcanus uses this building as his forge. It's kept locked while he's at the market, and he doesn't allow customers to wander around the building. And then at the bottom, so just down there, we get like a little sort of snippet that looks like it might be part of one of these sort of astral almanacs, which is nice to see to sort of give you an idea of how this sort of thing might work. We then move on to adventures, and we're given a number of suggestions for adventures here. The first one is a pantry raid. We're told that the barkeep and owner of the Fair Art Paleo is putting down like call mugs for the players. He gives them the key to his warehouse and discount rates if they can find the culprit who has raided his pantry and retrieve the missing goods. And then we get some more details of the warehouse and what it contains. And we're told a little bit about the Deep Warren, where there's a secret entrance to it, which seems to serve as a sort of underdark area to Dreamhaven. The adventure is split up into a number of sections. I'm not going to go into it in too much detail in case you want to run these adventures. But we get some cool NPC stats and pictures. And we get a couple of random tables here you know for determining what's in the warehouses and things like that we get effects from psychic winds and there's a random table for random planes of existence you know if you find a portal and you want to pop through it we then have beach psyombies which given the title i'm going to guess involves psychic zombies of some kind and this starts with the players approaching the bar and finding Paleo locking the door. He's heading out and invites the players along. This allows you to have like a, a sort of catch up scene, you know, getting to know the NPCs, mulling things over, exploring the area, and stuff like that. However, as they approach the sort of astral waters, they find that they are beyond deep black. A closer look finds some gold coins sparkling on the floor of the Sea of Souls. So you give a bit of time to uh, fish and do whatever, but eventually these Psyombies will make themselves known, shuffling under people's boats and out of the the astral waters. And we're given stats for them. They are fairly sort of typical undead zombies, with the exception that they have a psychic blast, which they can emit, causing people psionic damage. 
and we're given some more details of the origins of the psionic zombies and where they come from but again i'm not going to go into that with too much detail because you may want to run this we get another adventure called all that glitters again with some nice uh, tables for it and this event this adventure seems to take place more in the deep warren and as we scroll through we get a few details about that and we get some nice maps there so this is more of a sort of dungeon crawl into the deep war in this sort of underdark-esque sort of network of uh, subterranean cellars and such like below dreamhaven now we carry on scrolling through there we get a beautiful picture there of a celestial and that's very important for the setting. I won't tell you why, because I don't want to spoil the surprise. We get a number of optional classes for playing the the various non-humans and stuff like that. So we get the Ald Hesse, the Short Pale Slender Fae. We get an Astral Sailor class, which gives you particular skills related to cartography, astral navigation, things like that. We get the Onork, these orcish horned creatures who were once masters of all they surveyed on their home plane but they were confined wandering ald hesse their sudden appearance revealed that new worlds awaited to be explored and bargained with and they set off into the astral deeps and they they seem a little bit like your standard sort of half orky types you know they've got the, like the berserker rage although and they sort of struggle communicating with other people we get a scion class which is always nice to see because certainly old school essentials at the moment doesn't really have a robust psionic system with it so it's interesting to see that and we get a list of psionic powers as well all of these classes and it's it's very reminiscent of the the sort of second end ad and d psionic sort of classes and powers but sort of simplified down for the scale of bx and old school essentials we get a list of the powers and what pages are on, which is always nice to see, and the detailed descriptions of them. All of these classes are sort of in the, the, the BX slash old school essentials format and could be easily dropped into any game, even if you weren't using Dreamhaven. Although some of the, the sort of classes like the Astral Sailor, you won't really get a great deal of use out of their special abilities if you're not going to be going anywhere near the Astral Plane. So you can see there's a fair few abilities and then we have as always the open gaming license and we're on to the back cover of the book so what do i think about the planar compass i think it's a really interesting book that tries to sort of bring down and sort of hem in the the sort of idea of the astral plane now the astral plane is a great idea as a sort of transitive plane but it, cause it can lead to anywhere but it can be quite difficult to sort of grasp hold of i mean it, it's this this infinite expanse how, how do you portray that in games well by focusing in on dreamhaven this little port and sort of making it seem more like your sort of standard sort of sailing port but with a few differences and tweaks to make it obvious this is a planar sort of event it makes it much more manageable to have this as a good starting base for people who are setting off into the astral sea and i believe this year for zine quest 3 there is a second issue of the planar compass being released which is going to cover a more expansive view of the astral sea so i'll be looking forward to that basically if you're looking for to sort of step out into planar adventuring then this is a really good start because it sort of eases the players in and it provides plenty of hooks and plots and stuff like that that the gm can use to get their players into planar adventuring but it doesn't make it too massively complex to start with there's a nice mix of different classes npcs some lovely maps and the whole place is really evocative of that sort of freewheeling slightly piratical sort of vibe but taken to an extreme because we're in the fantasy astral here so if you're looking for a piratical campaign with a bit of a difference 
or you want to have your players take their first steps into planar adventuring, I advise you to pick up a copy of Planar Compass. I'll put a link to where it can be obtained on drive through down in the description below. And currently at the time of recording, it is available for, if I just check my price list, it is available for $6.99 in PDF from DriveThruRPG. I'm not sure if the printed version is available, but once I finish filming, I'll have a look. And if I can find a link to that, I'll put that in the description below as well. So like I say, for, for $6.99, if you're looking for a, a sort of piratical campaign with a bit of a twist, or you want to ease your players into planar adventuring, you could definitely do far worse than picking up a copy of Planar Compass and I highly recommend it. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. Until I see you next time, take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you soon.